Welcome back to the show. We're going to wrap up our week's focus on Chinese millennials by looking at a very special breed of them, the ones who are going global. And we have our very own in-house expert on this topic, Ms. Ying Ying Li. <clears throat> this show is not going to be all about me all of a sudden, but we will use my story as a reference point for a bigger discussion, one that we will continue in season two. I have definitely been very fortunate, but I'm also not alone. Yeah. In fact, the original Chinese student who went abroad to the U.S. to study and then bring his talents back to China was a man named Rong Hong, who began his journey 150 years ago. We'll take a look at how many Chinese are following in his and others' footsteps today, as well as get a sense of the reverse. We'll look at how many Americans are studying in China right now. Then we'll stitch everything together by looking at the net result of all this from both perspectives, and have a look ahead at next week and the end of season one of the show before we take a quick break for New Year's. <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting into this one today. Let's start with you telling us a bit about your own experience going global, Ning Ying. For people who haven't heard your story, can you give us an overview of that journey and what you gained from it? Sure. Well, the groundwork for my story was laid back in 2002. That's when this organization called ISIC entered China. And what does that stand for? ISIC stands for something in French, <laughs> but it's basically an NGO focused on international student population. It was established in 1948 after World War II with the goal of increasing cross-cultural communications to prevent future wars. Well, that seems like a natural fit for you, <laughs> and they played a pretty big role in your life, as it turns out. Yes, it's through them that I first went to India and Turkey for overseas changes. I was first student in my college back then to do so. It was an amazing experience. Ying Ying and I did a really in-depth interview on my other podcast, Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom, where we got into this in great detail. You can search that one and all the podcatchers and the follow-up chat as well, but I'll also put links to those in the resources page. So back to India and Turkey, though. This was an extremely formative experience for you, and it really laid the foundation for what you're doing so passionately today, right? Exactly. I am very grateful for my adventures in those two countries. The opportunity to pursue this kind of international cross-cultural exchange program showed up at exactly the right time in my life. I can't imagine how different things would be otherwise. And I also remember that you were an active early member of something called CAPE. Please tell us about that. CAPE stands for Collective Adventure Practice and Experience. Cool. Back when I jumped on board in 2011, when I first went to Turkey, we were a group of youth who were living and working all over the world, sharing a similar global vision. What we had in common was that we were all pretty good at foreign languages and savvy about using new media. When I came back home from Turkey, I published an article with over 30,000 words in it, sharing Turkish culture and my rich experience there. Wow. Now, as a frame of reference for people, today's show will probably be around 2,500 words. So that's a whole lot more than this. That's approaching small book-sized, or at least a weighty magazine. <laughs> well, I had been thinking about this for a long time, so I had a lot to say. No doubt. There are many reasons Chinese youth go global, such as doing overseas volunteer work to study abroad, etc. Although my own global journey began here in Asia, by going to India, then expanding to Middle East with Turkey, I always had my sights set on studying in the U.S. eventually. But as we said in the intro, I'm hardly the first Chinese person to do that. Right. That distinction goes to someone who made the trip over a century and a half ago during the Qing Dynasty. The first ever Chinese overseas student was a man named Rong Hong, and we'll hear you pronounce that correctly in a minute. <laughs> he went to the U.S. to study at Yale University, and he's regarded as the father of Chinese overseas students. And although they didn't use this term back at that time, he was also the very first Chinese sea turtle, too, yeah? <laughs> yeah, that's hai gui in Chinese. It is used nowadays to refer to someone who leaves China to go study abroad and maybe has option to stay and work in their host country or go elsewhere, but instead, they choose to swim back to China, bringing the new knowledge and insights back with them. After Rong Hong graduated, he chose not to stay in the United States, but decided 
to return to China immediately. So that's how you say that. Very good. <laughs> uh, this is significant, and it says a lot about his character. Having spent eight years in the U.S. and having developed excellent communication skills, apparently, he also, of course, had this inside understanding of U.S. culture to complement the learning and culture he brought with him from China. So Rong Hong would have almost certainly been able to land a interesting and well-paid job in the U.S. and live a pretty prosperous life. But apparently he felt that he had to return to his suffering homeland and do his part to use all his new knowledge to help make things better for people right away. His new perspective allowed him to see China's then backwardness in the world more clearly than other people. He also knew that to change things, the power of one person alone is inadequate. But his Yale education taught him to take responsibility and dare to think about and do big things. His dream became to make it possible for more Chinese students to study abroad, and it came true. It sure did. He devoted himself to sending young children to study in the U.S. As a result, more than 100 Chinese kids got to attend Yale's affiliated high school in Connecticut. Many of those graduates went on to Yale University proper or other prestigious schools in New England, mostly to study engineering and other majors that were relevant to the immediate and anticipated future needs of China back at that time. His efforts and those of the kids he enabled were hugely successful, as any college in the U.S. can tell you. Chinese students make up the largest percentage of foreign enrollment in the U.S. today by far. We will put some numbers on this shortly and discuss the impact in detail. But it's safe to say that the history of Chinese study abroad mirrors the history of modern China's development. The two timelines are inseparable. Now, charting this out decade by decade would be a fascinating topic for someone working on their PhD <laughs> dissertation, and would take just about the same amount of time to cover it in depth. So, it's a bit beyond the scope of this show to go too deep down the rabbit hole. So, let's just get a snapshot of where things are now overall, though. These numbers are pretty interesting. Yes, they are. Last year, there were over three hundred fifty thousand Chinese students in higher education in the U.S. That's thirty-three percent of the total of all foreign students, which is a little over one million, and that's a seven percent increase from the year before. We don't have the data for two thousand eighteen yet, but as far back as we look, it's been growing basically every year. Estimates place it at close to four hundred thousand now. Yep. For some added perspective, Indian students make up the second largest group, but they're only seventeen percent. So even a non-math major like me can quickly tell you that there are more than twice as many Chinese international students as compared to any other group, even the one other country that's basically the same size, like India. On the flip side, China expects to be hosting as many as half a million international students themselves by the year 2020. There were about 440,000 of them this last year, so they're on track to meet that goal. Now, more than half of them, about 58%, are from other Asian countries, and the amount of Americans studying here is super tiny by comparison. Only about 12,000 last year, actually. Wow. Yeah, right. But on any given weekend night, it does feel like about half of them are in line ahead of me to get a DD in sanitary if I go out. So <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure about that number. <laughs> Despite The low intake here from the U.S. It's easy to see why foreign study in general is so popular. From the perspective of cultural exchanges, studying abroad has a win-win effect. The benefits to students are obvious, and for the country receiving the student, having an international student who will return or at least visit home provides a degree of cultural transfer into the country. Yeah, the student is an unpaid ambassador of their country, and if they have a good experience abroad, then they can become an ambassador of sorts of their host country in school once they return home. Thinking about this led us to wonder what kind of cross-cultural impact do those Chinese students make when they're studying overseas, and how well is their new perspective welcomed back home? You can speak to this. There are real, personal, life-changing, transformative benefits to this. Going abroad means you have to face strong cultural conflicts head on. You will face loneliness while、well、away from your parents and friends, those familiar faces, and possibly discrimination from people in your host country. But the pros very much outweigh the cons. Living abroad trains you in ways nothing else can. First of all, a bilingual or multilingual environment makes people's brain more active. Also, if you have empathy, your heart opens wider, and your vision of the world itself can become greater. So the world you see is often different from the one that other people see. And since you can see and experience different lives, you will develop real empathy. 
And for me, for instance, that pushes me to want to make change happen instead of staying comfortable and only living for myself. I honestly want to change the world for better. That was a profound thing to realize, but it's real. Speaking of that, we're seeing more and more Chinese young entrepreneurs embrace the spirit of volunteerism and social impact. After yesterday's show, talking about the more vain or lethargic outliers, it's nice to report that there are many young Chinese entrepreneurs who care deeply about solving global inequality issues, and there's an organization called D Insider that helps them to do that. Right, they are a hub that focuses on enabling social impact and sustainable development. There are many entrepreneurs here. As we discussed a lot on earlier shows, we will be introducing some of the best and brightest ones to you in season two. Yeah, we're especially excited about that. What they and others like them around the world have in common is that they're thinking bigger than just themselves or even their countries. They are deeply aware of the interconnected nature of things, so they focus on solutions with a global impact. It's a pretty sweet time to be alive if you're young, woke, and motivated. Or if you're someone older, you know, like me, who's counting on these next generations to either figure stuff out that mine couldn't, or to continue or complete the work we've already started. And since Chinese millennials are independent thinkers like never before, they will be a huge part of this. Still, they slash we also need to work with and have the support of our NGOs. Also, scholars and cross industry leaders of all generations have great resources, experience, and vision to share. They can help us millennials best develop the future. Leaders of tomorrow. Youth entrepreneurship will truly determine our future. So we want to ask you, our listeners, if you have any great ideas about how to support the more aspirational Chinese youth in going global. If you do, please write to us. Yes, we'd love to hear your wisdom and reflect back on future shows. Thanks. <laughs> Another week is finished. Yeah, and we are currently releasing these shows on the same day we finish our prep and then record and edit them. So, audience, you are getting the results of our research plus whatever hot takes we have in the moment, like this one. We, we wish you a merry Christmas. We wish you a merry Christmas. We wish you a merry Christmas and a happy new year. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Now that's a little early, but it's still great timing in a way because we actually have a few of next week's shows in the can already, as we say in the business. Including the Christmas Eve show, so we wanted to wish you a nice one now. If you celebrate, we will also have much more to share on Chinese millennials' lives and culture. Some of which we'll do with the help of future guests on our upcoming shows in season two. So stay tuned for that. And we still have one more week of season one left, and it will keep coming at you even during Christmas. So if you've got some heavy napping and relaxing time planned to recover from those big holiday meals that we hope you're going to enjoy, we also hope we can entertain you a little bit in there too somewhere, or just take a nice break. We will be back regardless on Monday with a look at how to do with official government meetings of all kinds in China, including the big ones. Yeah, for most people, this will be a peek into a world you'd never see otherwise. So we're excited to leave you with all that before we take a short break for the new year ourselves. Until then, I'm Brendan Davis, and I'm Yingyi. See you next week on How China Works.